Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Chilling here. Just chilling as usual on my own. That is fine. Start reading today. Today, we 
are reading. Kazuo Ishiguro. Good morning, Ando. Good morning. Sorry, I was quiet earlier. I didn't know if that's a bot or it's if it's you. <laughs> Can never tell. But yeah, I'm just gonna start reading today. Alright. Uh, no, no nudibles tomorrow. I'm going to a um. Uh, a pop up bazaar marketplace to hang out with my friend. I haven't seen for a long time, so today is the last nudible for to for this week, and I'll see you guys again next Monday or so. <sighs> anyway, let's start today. <laughs> Sorry. <coughs> so I'm professional. I choked on my water just now and it's like still watering me until now. Okay. Today. Indeed. We are reading. Kazuo Ishiguro's A Pale View of Hills, Part 2, Chapter 7. As the summer grew hotter, the stretch of waste ground outside our apartment block became increasingly unpleasant. Much of the earth lay dry and cracked well. Water, which had accumulated during the rainy season, remained in the deeper ditches and craters. The ground bred all manners of insects, and the mosquitoes in particular steamed everywhere. In the apartment, there was the usual complaining, but over the years, the anger over the waste ground had become resigned and cynical. I crossed the ground regularly that summer to reach such ghost cottage, and indeed, it was a, a loathsome journey. Insects often caught in one's hair, and there were grubs and midges visible amidst the cracks and cracked surfaces. I still remember those journeys vividly, and they, like those misgivings about motherhood, like Ogata-san's visits, serve today to bring a certain distinctness to that summer, and yet, in many ways, that summer was much like any other. I spent many moments, as I was to do, to do throughout succeeding years, gazing emptily at the view from my apartment window. On clearer days, I could see far beyond the trees and on the opposite bank of the river a pale view outline of hills visible against the clouds. It was not an unpleasant view, and on occasions it brought me a rare sense of relief from the emptiness of those long afternoons I spent in that apartment. Apart from the matter of the waste grounds, there were other topics which preoccupied the neighborhood that summer. The newspapers were full of talk about occupation coming to an end, and in Tokyo, politicians were busy in arguments with each other. In the, in the apartments, the issue was discussed frequently enough, but with, but with much the same cynicism as colored talk concerning the waste ground. Received with more urgency were the reports of the child murders that were alarming Nagasaki at that time. First, a boy. Then, a small girl had been found battered to death. When the third victim, another little girl, had been found hanging from a tree, there were near panic amongst the mothers in the neighborhood. Understandably, little comfort was taken from the fact that the incidents had taken place from on the other side of the city. Children became a rare sight around the housing precinct, particularly in the evening hours. I am not sure to what extent these reports worried Sachiko at that time. Certainly, she seemed less inclined to leave Mariko unattended, but then, I suspect this has more to do with other developments in her life. 
she had received a reply from her uncle expressing his willingness to take her back into his household and soon after this news I noticed a change come over Sachiko's attitude to the little girl. She seemed somehow more patient and relaxed with the child. Sachiko had betrayed much relief about her uncle's letter and at first I had little reason to doubt she would return to his house. However, as the days went by, my suspicions grew about her intentions. For one thing, I discovered some days after the arrival of the letter that Sachiko had not yet mentioned the matter to Mariko. And then, as the weeks went on, not only did Sachiko make no preparations for moving, she had not, so I discovered, sent a reply to her uncle. Had Sachiko not been so peculiarly reluctant to talk about her uncle's household, I doubt it it if it would have occurred to me to ponder such a topic. As it was, I grew curious and despite Sachiko's reticence, I managed to gather certain impressions. For one thing, the uncle was not, it seemed, related by blood, but, but was a relative of Sachiko's husband. Sachiko had never known him prior to arriving his house several months earlier. The uncle was wealthy and since his house was an unusually large one and his daughter and a housemate at the uh, and housemate the other only occupants, there had been indeed plenty of room for Sachiko and her little girl. One thing Sachiko did mention more than once was her recollections of how large parts of the house had remained empty and silent. In particular, I became curious about the uncle's daughter, who I gathered to be an unmarried woman of roughly Sachiko's age. Sachiko would say little about her cousin, but then I do recall one conversation that we had around that time. I had by then formed an idea that Sachiko's slowness in returning to her uncle had to do with some tension which existed between herself and the cousin. I must have tentatively put this to Sachiko that morning, for it provoked one of the very few occasions upon which she talked explicitly about the time she had spent at her uncle's house. The conversation comes back to me quite vividly. It was one of those dry, windless morning of mid-August, and we were standing on the bridge at the top of our hill, waiting for a tram to take us into the city. I cannot remember where it was we were going that day, or where we had left Mariko. For I recall the child was not with us. Sachiko was gazing out at the view from the bridge, holding up a hand to shield her face from the sun. It puzzles me, Etsuko, she said. How you would ever manage to get hold of such an idea? On the contrary, Yasuko and I were the best of friends, and I'm greatly looking forward to seeing her again. I really don't understand how you could have thought otherwise, Etsuko. I'm sorry. I must have mis been mistaken, I said. For some reason, I suppose you had some reservations about returning there. Not at all, Etsuko. When you first met me, it was quite true. I was in the process of considering certain other possibilities, but a mother cannot be blamed for considering the different options that arise for her child, can she? It just so happened that for a while there, seem an interesting option open to us, but having given it further considerations, I now rejected it. That is all there is to it, Etsuko. I have no further interest in these other plans that were suggested to me. I'm glad everything has turned out for the best, and I'm looking forward to the day of my return to my uncle's house. As for Yasuko-san, we have the highest regards for each other. I don't understand what could have made you suppose otherwise, Atsuko. I do apologize. It's just that I, I thought you once mentioned a quarrel of some kind. A quarrel? She looked at me for a second, and then a smile spread over her face. 
Oh, now I understand what you're referring to. No, at school there was no quarrel. It was just some trivial tiff we had. What was it about now? You see, I don't even remember. It was so trivial. Oh yes, that's right. We were arguing about which of us should prepare the supper. Yes, really, that's all it was. You see, it's gone. We used to take it in turns. The housemate would cook one night, my cousin the next. Then it would be my turn. The housemaid was taken ill on one of her nights, and Yasko and I both wanted to cook. Yeah, now you must not misunderstand, Yasko. We generally get on very well. It's just that when you see so much of one person and no one else, things can get out of proportion at times. Yes, I understand. Now, I'm sorry. I was quite mistaken. You see, Yasko. When you have a housemaid to do all the little jobs for you, it is surprising how slowly the time goes by. Yes, Ko and I, we try to occupy ourselves one way or another, but really there was little to do other than sit and talk all day. All those months we sat in that house together, we hardly saw an outsider the whole time. It's a wonder we didn't really quarrel. Properly, I mean. Yes, it certainly is. I obviously misunderstood you before. Yes, let's go. I'm afraid you did. I only happen to remember the incident because it occurred just before I left, and I haven't seen my cousin since. But it's absurd to call it a quarrel. <laughs> In fact, I expect Yasuko's thinking of it and laughing about it too. Perhaps it was the same morning we decided that Sachiko, before Sachiko went away, we would together go on a day outing somewhere. And indeed, one hot afternoon, not long after, I accompanied Sachiko and her daughter to Inasa. Inasa is a hilly area of Nagasaki overlooking the harbor, renowned for its mountain scenery. It was not so far from where we lived. In fact, it was the hills of Inasa I could see from my apartment windows. But in those days, outings of any sort were rare for me, and the trip to Inasa seemed like a major excursion. excursion. I remember I looked forward to it for days. It is, I suppose, one of the better memories I have from those times. We crossed to Inasa by the ferry at the height of the afternoon. Noises from the harbor followed us across the water. The clang of hammers and the whine of machinery. The occasional deep sound from the ship's horn. But in those days in Nagasaki, such sounds were not unpleasing. They were the sound of recovery, and they were still capable then of bringing a certain uplifting feeling to one's spirit. Once we had crossed the water, the sea wind seems to blow more freely, and the day no longer fe felt so stifling. The sounds of the harbor carried in the wind still reach us as we sat on the bench in the forecourt of a cable car station. We were all the more grateful for the breeze, for the forecourt offered scant shelter for the, for, from the sun, and it was an open area of concrete which people that day largely by children and their mothers resemble a school playground. Over to one side, behind a set of turnstile, we could see the wooden platforms where the cable cars came to rest. For some moment, we sat mesmerized by the sight of the cable cars climbing and falling. One car would go rising away into the trees and gradually turning into a small dot against the sky, while its companion get come lower, growing larger until it heaved itself to the halt at the platform. Inside a small hut beside the turnstile, a man was operating some levers. He wore a cap and after each car had come down safely, he would lean out and chat to a group of children who had gathered to watch. The first of our encounters that day with the American woman occurred as a result of our deciding to take a cable car to the hilltop. 
Sachiko and her daughter had gone to buy the tickets and for a moment I was left sitting alone on the bench. Then I noticed at the far end of the forecourt a small stall selling sweets and toys. Thinking I would perhaps buy some candy for Mariko, I got to my feet and walked over to it. Two children were there before me, arguing about what to buy. While I waited for them, I noticed among the toys a pair of plastic binoculars. The children continued to quarrel. I glanced across the forecourt. Sachiko and Mariko were still standing by the turnstile. Sachiko seemed to be in a conversation with two women. Can I be of service, madam? The children had gone. Behind the store was a young man in a neat summer uniform. May I try this? I pointed to the binoculars. Certainly, madam. It's just a toy but quite effective. I put the binoculars to my face and looked towards the hill slope. They were surprisingly powerful. I turned to the forecourt and found Sachiko and her daughter in the lenses. Sachiko had dressed for the day in a light-colored kimono type with an elegant sash. A costume, I suspected, reserved only for special occasions. And she cut a graceful figure amidst the crowd. She was still talking to, to the woman, one of whom looked like a foreigner. A hot day again, madam, said the young man. As I handed him the money, are you riding on the cable car? We were just about to. It's a magnificent view. There's a television tower. We are building on the top. By next year, the cable car will go right up to it, right to the top. How splendid. Have a nice day, won't you? Thank you, madam. I made my way back across the forecourt and with the binoculars. Although at the time I did not understand English, I, sus I guessed at once that the foreign woman was American. She was tall, with red wavy hair and glasses which pointed up to the corners. She was addressing Sachiko in a loud voice, and I noted with surprise, with e with ease, with surprised the ease with which Sachiko replied in English. The other woman was Japanese. She had unnoticeably plump features and appeared to be around 40 or so. Beside her was a tubby little boy of about 8 or 9. I bowed to them as I arrived. Well, I wished them a pleasant day and then handed Mariko the binoculars. It's just a toy, I said. But you might be able to see a few things. Mariko opened the wrapping and examined the binoculars and with, with a serious expression. She looked through them, first around the forecourt, then up the hill slope. Say thank you, Mariko, Sachiko said. Mariko continued to look through the binoculars, then she brought them away from her face and put the plastic strap over her head. Thank you, etsuko -san. she said a little bit a little grudgingly. The American woman pointed at the binoculars, said something in English and laughed. The binoculars had also attracted some attention of the tabby boy who previously had been watching the hill slope and the descending cables, cable cars. He took a few steps towards Mariko, his eyes on the binoculars. That's very kind of you, Etsuko, said Sachiko. Not at all, it's just a toy. The cable car arrived and we went through the turnstile and, on, and onto the hollow wooden boards. The two women and the tabby boy, it seemed, were the only other passengers. The man with the cab came out from his hut and ushered us one by another. The interior looked stark and metallic. There were large windows on both sides and and all on all sides and the benches ran along the two larger walls. The car remained at the platform for several more minutes and the tubby boy began to walk around impatiently. Beside me, Mariko was looking out the window, her knees up on the bench from our side. From our side 
of the car. We could see the full court in the gathering of spectators at the turnstile. Mariko seemed to be testing the effectiveness of her binoculars, holding them to her to the to her eyes one moment, taking them away to the next. Then the tabby boy came and knelt on the bench beside her. For a little while, the two children ignored each other. Finally, the boy said, I want to have a look now. He held out his hand for the binoculars. Mariko looked at him coldly. Akira, don't ask like that, said his mother. Ask the little lady nicely. The little boy took Kisan away and looked at Mariko. The little girl stared back. The boy turned and went to another window. The children at the turnstile waved as the car began to pull away. I instinctively reached for the metal bar running along the window, and the American woman made a nervous noise and laugh. The forecourt was growing smaller, and then the hillside began to move beneath us. The cable car swayed gently as we climbed higher. For a moment, the treetop seemed to brush against the, el the windows. But then, suddenly, a large deep opened beneath us and we were hanging in the sky. Sachiko laughed softly and pointed to something out of the windows. Mariko continued to look through her binoculars. The cable car finished its climb and we fell out, and we fell out cash cash cautiously. As if uncertain, we had arrived on solid ground. The high station had no concrete fork cord, and we stepped off the wooden boards into the small grass clearing. Other than the uniformed men who ushered us out, there were no other people in sight. At the back of the clearing, almost amidst the pine trees, stood several wooden picnic tables. The near edge of the clearing where we had dis disembarked was marked by a metal fence which separated us from the cliff edge. When we had regained our bearings a little, we wandered over to the fence and looked out over the falling mountainside. After a moment, the two women and the boy joined us. Quite breathtaking, isn't it? The Japanese woman said to me. I'm just showing my friend all the interesting sights. She has never been to Japan before. I see. I hope she's enjoying it here. I hope so. Unfortunately, I don't understand English so well. Your friend seems to speak it much better than I do. Yes, she does speak it very well. We both glanced towards Sachiko. She and the American woman were again exchanging remarks in English. How nice to be so well educated, the woman said to me. Well, I hope you have a nice day. We exchanged bows. Then the woman made gestures to the American guests, suggesting they move off. Please, may I look? The tabby boy Please, may I look? The tabby boy said in an angry voice. Again, he was holding out his hand. Mariko stared at him as she had done in the cable car. I want to see it! The boy said more fiercely. Akira, remember to ask the little lady nicely. Please, I want to see it! Mariko continued to look at him for a second, then took the plastic strap from the, around her neck and handed the boy the binoculars. The boy put them to his face and for some moments glazed over the fence. These aren't any good, he said finally, turning to his mother. They aren't nearly as good as mine. Mother, look, you can't even see those trees over there properly. Take a look. He held the binoculars towards his mother. Mariko reached for them but the boy snatched them away and again offered them to the mother. Take a look, mother. You can't even see those trees, the near ones. Akira, give them back to the little lady now. They aren't nearly as good as mine. Now, Akira, that's not a nice thing to say. You know everyone isn't as lucky as you are. Mariko reached for the binoculars and this time, the boy let go. Say thank you to the, to the little lady, said his mother. The boy said nothing and started to walk away. The mother laughed a little. 
thank you very much she said to Mariko you were very kind then she smiled in turn towards Sachiko and myself splendid scenery isn't it she said I do hope you have a nice day the path was covered in pine needles and rose up the side of the mountain in zigzags we walked at, at an easy pace and often stopped to rest Mariko was quiet and rather to my surprise showed no signs of wishing to misbehave she did however display a curious reluctance to walk alongside her mother and myself at one moment she would be lagging behind causing us to cast anxious glances over our shoulders the next moment she would go running past us and walk on ahead we met the American woman for the second time an hour or so after we had disembarked from the cable car. She and her companion were coming back down the path, coming back down the path and recognizing us gave us cheerful greetings. The tabby boy coming behind them ignored us. As she passed, the American woman said something to Sachiko in English and when Sachiko replied, gave out a loud laugh. She seemed to want to stop and talk, but the Japanese woman and her son did not break their step. The woman, the American woman, waved and walked on. When I complimented Sachiko on the command of English, she laughed and said nothing. The encounter I noticed had had a curious effect on her. She became quiet and walked on beside me as if lost in thought. Then, when Mariko had once rushed on ahead, she said to me, My father was a highly respected man at school, highly respected indeed, but his foreign connections almost resulted in my marriage proposal being withdrawn. She smiled slightly and shook her head. How odd at school. Things all seem like another age now. Yes, I said. Things have changed so much. The path bent sharply and began to climb again. The trees fell away and suddenly the sky seemed huge and all around us. Up ahead, Mariko shouted something and pointed. Then she hurried on excitedly. I never saw a great deal of my father, Sachiko said. He was abroad much of all the time in Europe and America. When I was young, I used to dream that I would go to America one day, that I would go there and become a film actress. My mother used to laugh at me. But my father told me if I learned my English well enough, I could easily become a business girl. I used to le enjoy learning English. Mariko had stopped at what looked like a plateau. She shouted something to us again. I remember once, Sachiko went on, my father brought a book back from America for me, an English version of A Christmas Carol. That became something of an ambition of mine at school. I wanted to learn English well enough to read that book. Unfortunately, I never had the chance. When I married, my husband forbade me to continue learning. In fact, he made me throw the book away. That seems rather a pity, I said. My husband was like that, very strict and very patriotic. He was never the most considerate of men, but he came from a highly distinguished family and my parents considered it a good match. I did not protest when he forbade me to study English. After all, there seemed little point anymore. We reached the point, the spot where Mariko was standing. It was a square area of ground that jutted off the edge of the path, bound in by several large boulders. A thick tree trunk fallen on its side and we had been con converted into a bench. The top surface, having been smooth and flattened, Sachiko and I sat down to recover our breath. Don't go too near the edge, Mariko. Sachiko called. The little girl had walked out to the, to the boulders and was looking at the view with her binoculars. I had a rather precarious feeling perched on the edge of the mountain looking out over such a view. A long way below us, we could see the harbor looking like a 
dense piece of machinery left in the water. Across the harbour, the opposite bank, rose the series of hills that led into Nagasaki. The land at the foot of the hills was busy with houses and buildings. Far over to our right, the harbour opened out onto the sea. We sat there for a while, recovering our breath and enjoying the breeze. Then I said, You wouldn't think anything had ever happened here, would you? Everything looks so full of life. But all that area down there, I waved my hand at the view below us. All that area was so badly hit when the bomb fell. But look at it now. Sachiko nodded, then turned to me with a smile. How cheerful you are today, Etsuko, she said. But it's so good to come out here. Today, I decided that I am going to be optimistic. I am determined to have a happy future. Mrs. Fujiwara always tell me how important it is to keep looking forward. And she's right. If people didn't do that, then all this, I pointed again at the view, all this will still be rubble. Sachiko smiled again. Yes, as you say, Etsuko, it will all be rubble. For a few moments, she continued to gaze at the view below us. Incidentally, Etsuko, she said after a while, your friend, Mrs. Fujiwara, I assume she lost her family in the war. I nodded. She had five children, and her husband was an important man in Nagasaki. When the bomb fell, they all died except for her eldest son. It must have been such a blow to her, but she just kept going. Yes, said Sachiko, nodding slowly. I thought something of the nature had happened. And did she always have the noodle shop of hers? No, of course not. Her husband was an important man. That was only afterwards, after she lost everything. Whenever I see her, I think to myself, I have to be like her. I should keep looking forward. Because in many ways, she lost more than I did. After all, look at me. I'm about to start a family of my own. Yes, how right you are. The wind had disturbed Sachiko's carefully combed hair. She passed her hand through it, then took a deep breath. <sighs> How right you are, Etsuko. We shouldn't keep looking back to the past. The war destroyed many things for me, but I still have my daughter. As you say, we have to keep looking forward. You know, I said, it's the only last few days I've really thought about what's going to be like to have a child. I mean, I don't feel nearly so afraid now. I'm going to look forward to it, and I'm going to be optimistic from now on. And you should, Atsuko. After all, you have a lot to look forward to. In fact, you will discover soon enough it's being a mother that makes life truly worthwhile. What do I care if life makes a little doll at my uncle's house? All I want is the best for my daughter. We will get her the best private tuition and she'll catch up on her schoolwork in no time. As you say, Esko, we must look forward to life. I'm so glad you feel that way, I said. We should, not, we should both... We should, both of us, be grateful, really. We may have lost a lot in the war, but there's still so much to look forward to. Yes, Esko, there's a lot to look forward to. Mariko came nearer and stood in front of us. Perhaps... She had overheard some of our conversation, for she said to me, We're going to leave Yasuko-san again, did mother tell you? Yes, I said, she did. Are you looking forward to living with her again, Mariko-san? We might be able to keep the kittens now, the little girl said. There's plenty of room at Yasuko-san's house. We'll have to see about that, Mariko, said Sachiko. Mariko looked at her mother for a moment, then she said, but Yasuko-san likes cats. And anyway, Maru was Yasuko-san's cat before we took her. So the kittens are hers too. Yes, Mariko. But we have to see. We have to see 
What Yasuko-san's father will say? The little girl regarded her mother with a sullen look, then turned to me once more. We might be able to keep them, she said with a serious expression. Towards the latter of the afternoon, we found ourselves back in the clearing where we first stepped off the cable car. There still remain some... Uh, Remain in our lunch boxes some biscuits and chocolates. And so we sat down for a snack at one of the picnic tables, and at the other end of the clearing, a handful of people were gathered near the metal fence, awaiting the cable car that would take them back down the mountain. We had been sitting at the picnic table for several minutes when a voice made us look up. The American woman came striding ac across the clearing. A broad smile on her face. Without the least of sign of bashfulness, she sat down at our desk, at, a, at our table, smiled to us in turn, and then began to address Hachiko in English. She was, I suppose, grateful for the chance to communicate with other, ad, other than by means of gestures. Looking around, I spotted the Japanese woman nearby putting on a jacket on her son. She appeared less enthusiastic for our company, but eventually she came towards our table with a smile. She sat down opposite me, and when her son sat beside her, I could see the extent with which mother and child shared the same plump features. Most noticeably, their cheeks had the kind of same fleshy baggy, sagginess to them, not unlike the cheeks of bulldogs. The American woman all the while continued to talk loudly to Sachiko. After, at the, sorry, at the arrival of the strangers, Mariko had opened a sketchbook and began to draw. The plump woman, after exchanging a few pleasantries with me, turned to the little girl. And have you enjoyed your day? She asked Mariko. It's very pretty up here, isn't it? Mariko continued to pray on her page, not looking up. The woman, however, did not seem to be in the least deterred. What are you drawing there? she asked. It looks very nice. This time, Mariko stopped drawing and looked at the woman wholly. That looks very nice. May we see? The woman reached forward and took the sketchbook. Aren't this nice, Akira? she said to her son. Isn't the little girl, little lady clever? The boy leaned across the table for a better view. He regarded the drawing with interest but said nothing. They are very nice indeed. The woman was turning over the pages. Did you do all this today? Mariko remained silent for a moment. Then she said, The crayons are new. We brought them this morning. It's harder to draw with new crayons. I see. Yes, new crayons are harder, aren't they? Akira here draws too, don't you, Akira? Drawing is easy, the boy said. Aren't these little, aren't these nice little pictures, Akira? Mariko pointed to the open page. I don't like that one there. The crayon wasn't one enough. The one in the next page is better. Oh yes, this is lovely. I did it down at the harbor, said Mariko. But it was noisy and hot down there, so I hurried. But it's very good. Do you, did you enjoy drawing? Yes. Sachiko and the American woman had both turned towards the sketchbook. The American woman pointed the drawing and uttered loudly several times in Japanese words for delicious. One more. Please. And what's this? The plump-faced woman continued. A butterfly! 
It must have been very hard to draw it so well. It couldn't have stayed still for very long. I remembered it, said Mariko. I saw one earlier on. The woman nodded and turned to Sachiko. How clever your daughter is. I think it's very commendable for a child to use her memory and imagination. So many children at this age are still copying out of books. Yes, said Sachiko. I suppose so. I was really surprised at the dismissiveness of her tone, for she has been talking to the American in her most gracious manner. The tabby boy leaned further across the table and put his finger on the page. Those ships are too big, he said. If that's supposed to be a tree, then the ships would be much smaller. The mother considered this for a moment. Well, perhaps, she said. but. It's a lovely little drawing all the same, don't you think, Akira? The ships are, way, are far too big, said the boy. The woman gave a laugh. You must excuse Akira, she said to Sachiko. But you see, he has quite a distinguished tutor for his drawing. So he's obviously much more discerning about these things than most children his age. Does your daughter have a tutor for her drawing? No, she doesn't. Again. Sachiko's tone was unmistakably cold. The woman, however, appeared to notice nothing. It's not a bad idea at all, she went on. My husband was against it at first. He thought that it was quite enough for Akira to have home tuition for math and science. But I think drawing is important too. A child should develop his imagination while he was young. The teachers at his school all agree with me, but he gets on best with math. I think math is very important, don't they? Yes, indeed. I'm sure it's very useful. Math sharpens children's mind. You'll find most children good at math are very good at most other things. My husband and I were in no disagreement about getting a math tutor, and it's been well worth it. Last year, Akira always come third or fourth in his class, but this year, he's been top throughout. Math is easy, the boy announced, and he said to Mariko, Do you know the nine times table? His mother laughed again. I expect the little lady very clever too. Her drawing certainly shows promise. Math is easy, the boy says again. The nine times table is easy as anything. Yes, Akira knows all his multiplications now. A lot of children his age only know after three or four. Akira knows what nine times five. Nine times five ma makes forty-five. And nine times nine? Nine times nine makes eighty-one. The American woman asked Sachiko something, and when Sachiko nodded, she clapped her hands and once more repeated the word delicious several times. Your daughter seems to be a bright little lady, the plump woman said to Sachiko. Does she enjoy school? Akira likes almost everything at school. Apart from math and drawing, he gets on very well with geography. A friend, my friend here was uh, very surprised to find Akira knew the names of all the large cities in America, weren't you, suzy san The woman turned to her friend and spoke several faltering words of English. The American woman did not appear to understand but smiled approvingly towards the boy. But math is Akira's favorite subject, isn't it, Akira? Math is easy! And what does the little girl, little lady enjoy most at school? The woman asked. Turning again to Mariko, Mariko did not answer for a moment. Then she said, "I like math too. You like maths too? That's splendid." What's nine times six then? The boy asked her angrily. It's so nice when an interest, when children take an interest in the school work, isn't it? Go on. What's nine times six? I asked. What does Akira-san want to do when he grows up? Akira, tell the lady what you're going to become. Head director of Mitsubishi Corporation. His father's firm.
his mother explained. Akira is very, already very determined. Yes, I see, I said smiling. How wonderful. Who does your father work for? Who does your father work for? The boy asked Mariko. Now, Akira, don't be too inquisitive. It's not nice. The woman turned to Sachiko again. A lot of boys his age are still saying they want to be policemen or firemen. But Akira wanted to work for Mitsubishi since he was much younger. Who does your father work for? The boy asked again. This time, his mother, instead of intervening, looked towards Mariko expectantly. He's a zookeeper said Mariko. For a brief moment, nobody spoke. Curiously, the answer seemed to humble the boy. He sat back on his bench with a sulky expression. Then, his mother said a little s uncertainly, What an interesting occupation. We are very fond of animals. Is your husband soon nearby? Before Sachiko could reply, Mariko had clambered off the bench noisily. Without a word, she walked away from us and towards a cluster of trees nearby. We all walk her, walk her for a moment. Sorry, we all watched her for a moment. Is she your eldest? The, the woman asked Sachiko. I have no others. Oh, I see. It's not a bad thing, really. A child can be more independent that way. I think a child often works harder too. There's six years difference between this one. She put a hand on his the boy's head and the oldest one. The American woman produced a loud exclamation and clapped her hands. Mariko was progressively steady up the branches of a tree. The plump faced woman returned in to her seat and then look up at Mariko's worriedly. Your idea is quite a tomboy. The American woman repeated the word tomboy gleefully and clapped her hands again. Is it safe? The plant woman said. The plant woman asked. She might fall. Sachiko smiled and her manner towards the woman seemed to grow in sudden, suddenly warmer. Are you not used to children climbing trees? She asked. One moment please. Morning Taza! My voice is a little soft. Mm. I think maybe because I was like moving around a little bit. But when I pointed my mouth towards the... Hello, can you hear me? The microphone then it should be okay. Okay. Oh, I, I need to refresh my party finder as well. Okay, let me change my seated position because I don't know why, but I was falling asleep. 
<laughs> so I keep pausing so much. I like put on eye drops and all that, drinking my coffee. Uh, I woke up too early today, basically. I want to take a nap after this. Get in here. <laughs> I think Fupuchu is uh, Coco, right? Yeah, Coco, sorry I didn't attend your wedding. I had something to attend to that day. So, my apologies for asking for an invite and then didn't attend. I'm the worst. <laughs> I'm the worst at like attending weddings. I always forget the time and day and then I sleep early. Usually you guys do weddings at night. Okay. You see properly. Okay. Sorry, I'm back. Okay, let's continue. The con the the woman continued to watch anxiously. Are you sure it's safe? A branch may may break. Sachiko gave a laugh. I'm sure my daughter knows what she's doing. Thank you all the same for your concern. It's so kind of you. She gave the woman an elegant bow. The American woman said something to Sachiko and they began conversing again in English. The plant faced woman turned away from the trees. Please don't think of me impertinent, she said, putting her. Uh, 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 putting a, a hand on my arm. But I couldn't help noticing. Will this be your first time? Yes, I said with a laugh. We are expecting it in the autumn. How splendid. And your husband? Is he also a zookeeper? Oh no, he works for an electronics firm. Really? The woman began to give me advice concerning the care of babies. Meanwhile, I could see over her shoulder the boy wandering away from the table towards Mariko's tree. And it's an idea to let the child hear lots of music, the woman was saying. I'm sure that makes a lot of difference. A child should hear good music amongst the earliest of sounds. Yes, I'm very fond of music. The boy was standing at the foot of the tree looking up at Mariko with a puzzled expression. Our older son doesn't have a spine as an ear for music as Akira, the woman went on. My husband said this is because he didn't hear enough good music when he was a baby. And I tend to think that he's right. In those days, the radio was broadcasting so much military music. I'm sure it did no good at all. As the woman continued to talk, I could see the boy was trying to find a foothold in the tree trunk. Mariko had come lower and appeared to be advising him. Beside me, the American woman kept laughing loudly, occasionally uttering single words in Japanese. The boy finally managed to 
hoist himself off the ground and had one foot pressed into the crevice and was holding onto a branch with both ha with both hands. Although only a few centimeters off the ground, he seemed to be in a state of high tension. It was hard to say if she did so deliberately, but as she lowered herself, the boy, the little, the little girl, trod firmly on the boy's fingers. The boy gave a shriek, falling clumsily. The mother turned in alarm. Sachiko and the American woman, neither of whom had seen the incident, also turned towards the fallen boy. He was lying on his side making a loud noise. His mother ran towards him and kneeling beside him began to feel his legs. The boy continued his noises. Across the clearing, passengers waiting for the cable car were all looking our way. After a minute or so, the boy came sobbing to the table guided by his mother. Tree climbing is so dangerous, the woman said angrily. He didn't fall that far, I assured her. He was hardly on the tree at all. He might have broken a bone. I think children should be discouraged from climbing trees. It's so silly. She kicked me, the boy sobbed. She kicked me off the tree. She tried to kill me. She kicked you? The little girl kicked you? I saw Sachiko cast a glance towards her daughter. Mariko was once more high up the tree. She tried to kill me. The little girl kicked you. Your son just slipped. I interrupted quickly. I saw it all. He hardly fell any distance. She kicked me. She tried to kill me. The woman also turned and glanced towards the tree. He just slipped, I said again. You shouldn't be doing such silly things, Akira. The woman said angrily. It's very, very dangerous to climb trees. She tried to kill me. You're not to go up trees. The boy continued to sob. Stretch. Thank you. Good morning, Sam. Good morning. Sam, just for information, I may not be able to make it to Australia in July because your government hates me. Just an FYI. <laughs> oh, it's afternoon? Sorry. Good afternoon. Yes, it is now afternoon. Right at noon. Good afternoon. Yeah, sorry, my s yeah. I mean, it's not as bad as Japanese government right now, so at least I can still. No, I don't blame them. There's just way too many fucking Malaysians who overstay their welcome and fuck it up all for us who are really there for. <sighs> holidays so pretty sad about that because I know uh, I have a time limit to visit and uh, it's only in July that I can go there uh, and uh, yeah it's fucked I don't think I can get the ETA on time I may be able to visit next time uh, only if I can sort out accommodation, that's all. Um, yeah. But we'll see, we'll see. I'll make it there one day. One of these days, one of next year, I don't know. I don't fucking know. It is sad, but it's okay. We'll see. I, it's my fault. Anyway, I didn't know that it takes so long nowadays to apply for it. Like many years ago when I went there, it just takes me like less than a day to get it. Yeah, we should do that, I guess. I don't know. I'm so like the problem is that I'm I go to sleep so early nowadays compared to months ago. So, I don't know. We'll see. Maybe, maybe Tomorrow I'm busy though, so I can't. Tomorrow I'll be out the whole day, so I can't really hang. 
um, I'm getting fucking old. Like, I have to do yoga every morning just to make sure that I want my bones don't feel like it's breaking by the end of the day. It's bad. I'm old. <laughs> See, you agree. Strider would never agree that I'm old. He's always like, you're still so young. But I am old as fuck. Anyway. How you been doing, Sam? I I saw the chat in the Discord. I wanted to reply, but I'm like, I'm so tired. I'm so tired of everything nowadays. I'm tired of waking up. Tired of tired of going to sleep. Tired of making breakfast. Tired of drinking coffee. Tired of tired of everything. Ah, that's good. Work is good. Yeah, I mean, I've been catching up on my work too. I need money. You know. I need money. Everyone needs money. But yeah, it would be nice if I can meet up with you guys. You guys should take me to party. I've never partied before. Uh, what do you guys do at party anyway? Drink? I can't drink though. I'm a terrible drunk. <sighs> Let's take a short break and chat with people. <laughs> I don't think I don't think Stuart gets wasted that easily. He told me before he doesn't get Waste that easily. I don't know. I I will I hundred percent get wasted easily. Just need to give me two beer and I'm out. <laughs> and I don't even really like beer that much. So much carbs in them. Give me vodka. Give me vodka highball. Whiskey highball. Yeah, I like those things. God, can I stop yawning, please? Jesus Christ. Ah, uh, so you'll be the designated um, driver, huh? Because of principle. I don't used to drink. Because uh, I know I'm a terrible drunk. And then I... Uh, Started to learn how to drink um, when I was uh, working at a uh, Japanese company, and they always <coughs> make you drink whenever they have the chance. And there was one time I remember I was in Japan, and we had like a picnic, uh, a cherry blossom picnic thingy going on and the boss of the company just kept pouring me a 9% uh, highball non-stop like and it's rude if you don't drink it so I just keep drinking it and by like fucking 4 p.m. like 3 2 or 3 p.m. 2 or 3 p.m. I was so fucking drunk people had to drag me back to the to the Dormitory to the hostel. It's ter It's embarrassing. I was so drunk, it, like high in the afternoon in the in the uh, train. So fucking embarrassing. I had, had like photos of that. People took photos of that. They were having fun. I'm. I wasn't. 
I was bullied into drinking basically. But yeah, my alcohol tolerance at the time was quite high. Um, nowadays not anymore. It was quite high again early this year when I couldn't sleep and I keep you I keep drinking wine to go to sleep. I don't know if uh, Studio told you that, but I would drink wine almost every night because I <laughs> want to go to sleep, but I couldn't go to sleep. I had terrible insomnia. Um, but now I have certain awesome medication that put me to sleep. In like 30 minutes Wine mom <laughs> Yeah, I'm a wine mom now I don't even like Like I'm okay I, I, I'm okay with wine I, I But I wouldn't say like I I would like Crave for wine or anything I only drink wine Because that's the only thing available In my fridge Because my sister Collects wine My sister and her husband Collects wine So I just keep opening All the wine <laughs> Because I kept asking, like, can I, can I drink this? Because, like, you guys kept this in the fridge for, like, years. Like, can I have it? Like, <laughs> I don't know, there was, like, you can ask Strider about this. Like, there was a night, probably, that I drank, like, half a bottle of wine. And I don't remember anything the next day. And then nobody would tell me what i do the next day. And then... The Nuna Moon counter started from then on. No fucking way. No way. No way. <laughs> like a bingo thing. Like if something happened, I'll take a sip. Something like that. I would die on stream. I need adult supervision. I can do that if one day I really make it to the to where you guys are. We can do that kind of stream. Then you guys can take care of me after I'm drunk. Put me into bed. Cause I'm a sleepy drunk. Depends. Sometimes sometimes I'm a noisy drunk. Sometimes I'm a sleepy drunk. It depends. Highly, highly depends. But yeah. And I'm Asian, so I, I get the Asian flush easily. Why am I talking? Like, I'm just chatting with Sam right now. Like, in the middle of the story, the book reading session. Hell yeah. I'm enjoying this. I'm awake now. I was, like, seriously falling asleep just now. Now I'm fucking awake. And... But uh, Coco is uh, sleeping there, unfortunately. <laughs> Judging you. <laughs> Bonus commentary? Hell yeah, bitch. <laughs> Coco, what's your, your what's your um, what's your uh, preferred drink? Of choice. What's your choice of your? Uh, what's the? Yes. What's your favorite alcoholic drink? Yes, we should definitely. Yes, we should definitely do that when I. Yeah, I'm still planning to come. It's just that I need to sort out accommodations. Do you have a? Do you have a couch for me, Sam? I don't mind, just a couch. You know. <laughs> if you don't mind having. And an Asian girl sleeping on your couch. <laughs> I just need just I just need to sort that out. Like I just need free accommodations. That's all I need. Then I can be there. Like even after July. Cause the whole thing is that I need to be you know the timeline, right? For Strider. I don't know if he told you. I'm pretty sure he told you, but yeah. I can only stay at his place until like end of your dad oh you staying with your family damn yeah your, your, your dad might hate it weird asian girl sleeping in the fucking couch <laughs> i thought you i thought you stay outside somewhere like renting or something wow that sucks yeah i just need to start up my accommodation all right like 
I'll see how it goes. I I'm still very interested in going. Out. It's just that the fucking ATA is so, is so delayed that I don't think I could make it uh within July. Uh I don't know. We'll see. Like I'll just couch surf. You have a spare room? If you have a s <gasps> Oh my god Then it's settled, right? Sam, I can just stay with you Then we'll go crash With like Strider And I can like We can go help him move and all that If you are okay with that I'm up for it, bro Seriously Like I won't make much noise I just need Some like I would probably spend most of my Time uh, With Strider If he wants to spend time with me Like you know Cause he said He told me that he will show me around Fucking Melbourne and shit You know what I mean So I like I won't make much noise. I just need a place to stay. If you don't mind. Like. I just need free accommodations. Because I can't afford. Like. Staying. In hostels. Not even hostels. Because they are so expensive. In fucking Australia. Yes. Thank you Sam. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I will let you know. Okay. I will. I will plan things out with you. Because. Strudel's ghosting me right now. He's 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 dealing with his shit. I will I'll plan shit out with you instead. Okay, I'll let you know when I get my ETA and then I'll buy my ticket. I will plan the travel time with you and then I'll I will, we can work things out. All right, I I I promise I won't overstay my welcome in Australia and become a fugitive. I promise that. <laughs> I found it funny. Yes, I know it's a maybe. Yeah, but yeah, if your if your dad is okay, I'm I'm I'm, I don't steal. Maybe I'll just like you know. I'll I'll get my own grocery, so don't worry. Like, just yeah, we'll we'll maybe yeah right? okay. Yeah, we'll we'll see how it works. Okay, all right. I find it funny that I have seven viewers here, like listening to me talk about me, my potential of traveling to Aussie land, and I'm not even fucking reading the book that I'm supposed to be reading right now. But I'm very much awake right now. I was like seriously falling asleep just now. All right, let me sit up straight once again and continue reading the book. But yes, uh, Sam. Drop me a message on Discord. We'll, we can talk about it. But as of now. Yeah, so everyone wants to come to Melbourne now. Let's all meet up at Melbourne. We do a Melbourne meetup. Everyone. <laughs> Maybe an Airbnb might be a better choice. Like a, a small apartment. Ah, they are so expensive nowadays. I check their prices. Insane. And my currency is so shit right now. Ah, two viewers just left because I wasn't reading. I'm gonna go back to reading some. Alright. I mean, <laughs> actually, I think people are more interested in me talking about st stupid shit than actually reading because there were like just like three people listening to me just now anyway let's continue reading um we are still on chapter seven surprisingly chapter seven is quite long chapter seven of part two of a pale view of hues by kazuo ishiguro let us continue yeah uh so yeah that's the thing i wish i could come up like I'm like seriously, if I can get my ETA within this week, I could have just fly next week. 
but the problem is I don't it's Friday and I still haven't gotten anything from your government so there you go I, I even try to check on my I even try to check on my uh, fucking uh, spam box but nothing there at all it's very unfortunate really I don't understand why it would take them so long Let's continue. In Japanese cities, much more than in England, the restaurant owners, the tea house proprietors, the shopkeepers all seem to will the darkness to fall. Long before the daylight has faded, lanterns appear in the window, lighted signs above the doorways. Nagasaki was already full of the colors of nighttime as we came back out into the street that evening. We had left Inasa in the late afternoon and had been eating supper on the restaurant floor of the Hamaya department store. Afterwards, reluctant to end the day, we found ourselves strolling through the side streets in, the, in little hurry to reach the tram depot. depot. In those days, I remember it had become the vogue for young couples to be seen in publics holding hands, something Jiro and I never done, and as we walked, we saw many such couples seeking their evening entertainment. The sky, as often on those summer evenings, had become a purple, a pale purple color. Many of the stalls sold fish, and at that time of the evening, when the fishing boats were coming on, into the harbor, one would often see men pushing their way through the crowded side streets, carrying on their shoulders baskets heavy of freshly, freshly caught fish. It was on such side streets filled with litter and casually strolling people, we came across the Kujik Biki stand. Since it was not my since it was my it was never my habit to indulge in a Kujibiki and since it has no equivalence here in England except perhaps in fairgrounds, I might ha well for have forgotten the existence of such thing were it not for my memory of that particular evening. We stood at the back of the crowd and watched. A woman was holding up a, lo a young boy of around two or three up on the platform a man with a handkerchief tied around his head and stooping forward with the ball so the child could reach the boy managed to pick out a ticket but did not seem to know what do what to do with it he held it in his hand and looked emptily at the amused faces all around him the man with the handkerchief bent lower and made some remark to the child which caused the people around about to laugh in the end, the mother lowered the child, took the ticket from him and handed it to the man. The ticket won a lipstick, which the woman accepted with a laugh. Mariko was standing on her tiptoes, trying to see the prizes displayed at the back of the stall. Suddenly, she turned to Sachiko and said, I want to buy a ticket. It's rather a waste of money, Mariko. I want to buy a ticket. There was a curious urgency in her manner. I want to try the Kujibiki. Here you are, Mariko. I offered her the coin. She turned to me, a little surprised. Then she took the coin and pushed her way through the front to the, to the front of the crowd. A few more contestants tried their luck. A woman won a piece of candy. A middle-aged man won a rubber ball. Then came Mariko's turn. Now, little princess. The man shook the ball with deliberation. 
Close your eyes and think hard about that big bear over there. I don't want a bear, said Mariko. The man made a funny face and people laughed. You don't want a big furry bear? Well, well, little princess, what is it that you want? Mariko pointed to the back of the stall. That basket, she said. The basket? The man shrugged. All right, princess, close your eyes tight and think about your basket. Ready? Mariko's ticket won a flower pot. She came back to where we were standing and handed me her prize. Don't you want it? I ask, you want it? I wanted the basket. The kittens need a new basket of their own now. Well, never mind. Mariko turned to her mother. I want to try once more. Sachiko sighed. It's getting late now. I want to try just once more. Again, she pushed her way towards the platform. As we waited, Sachiko turned to me and said, It's funny. But... I had a quite different impression of her. Your friend, Mrs. Fujiwara, I mean. Oh? Sachiko leaned her head to see past the spectators. No, Etsuko, she said. I'm afraid. I never saw her in quite the way you do. Your friend struck me as a woman with nothing left in her life. But that's not true, I said. Oh? And what does she have to look forward to, Etsuko? What does she have to live for? She has a shop. It's nothing grand, but it means a lot to her. A shop? And she has her son. Her son has a very promising career. Sachiko was looking again at the stall. Yes, I suppose so, she said with a tired smile. I suppose she has a son. This time, Mariko won a pencil and came back to us with a sullen expression. We started to go, but Mariko was still looking towards the Kujibiki stand. Come on, Sachiko said. Etsuko san needs, needs to be getting home now. I want to try once more, just once more. Sachiko sighed impatiently, then looked at me. I shrugged and gave a laugh. All right, said Sachiko. Try once more. Several more people won prizes. Once, a young man won a face compact and appropriateness of the prize provoked some applause. Upon seeing Mariko appear for the third time, the man with the handkerchief pulled another of his amusing faces. Well, princess, back again! Still won the basket? Wouldn't you prefer the big furry bear? Mariko said nothing waiting for the man to offer her the bowl. When she had picked up a ticket, the man examined it closely, then glanced behind him to where the prizes were exhibited. He scrutinized the ticket once more and then finally gave a nod. You have not won the basket, but you have won a major prize. There was a laugh, there was laughter and applause all around. The man went to the back of the stall and returned with what looked like a large wooden box. For your mother to keep her vegetables in, he announced to the crowd rather than to Mariko, and for a brief moment held up the prize. Beside me, Sachiko burst into laughter and joined in the applause. A gangway formed to allow Mariko through her prize. Sachiko was still laughing as we came away from the crowd. She had laughed so much that the small tears had appeared in her eyes. She wiped them away and looked at the box. What a strange looking thing, she said, passing it to me. It was the size of an orange box and surprisingly light. The wood was smooth but unvarnished. But and won't and on one side there were two sliding panels of wire gaze. It may came, come in useful, I said, sliding open a panel. I won a major prize, said Mariko. Yes, well done, Sachiko said. I won a kimono once, Mariko said to me. In Tokyo, I won a kimono once. Well, Mariko, 
You have won again! Let's go. Perhaps you could carry my bag. Then I could carry this object home. I won a major prize, said Mariko. Yes, you are very good, said her mother and laughed a little. We walked away from the Kujibiki stand and the street was littered with discarded newspapers and all manners of rubbish. The kittens could live in there, couldn't they? Mariko said. We could put rugs inside it and it could be their house. Sachiko looked doubtfully at the box in her arms. I'm not sure they would like it so much. That could be their house. Then when we go to Yasuko-san's house, we could carry them in there. Sachiko smiled tiredly. We could, couldn't we, mother? We could carry the kittens in there. Yes, I suppose so, said Sachiko. Yes, alright, we'll carry the kittens in there. So we can keep the kittens, son? Yes, we could keep the kittens. I'm sure Yasuko-san's father won't object. Mariko ran a little way ahead, then waited for us to catch up. So we won't have to find homes for them anymore? No, not now. We are going to Yasuko-san's house, so we'll keep the kittens after all. We won't have to find owners then. We can keep them all. We can take them in a box, wouldn't, couldn't we, mother? Yes, says Sachiko. She tossed back her head and once more began to laugh. I often f recall, I often find myself recalling Mariko's faces with the way I saw it that evening on the tram going home. She was staring out the window. Her forehead pressed against the glass, a boyish face caught in the changing lights of the city rattling by outside. Mariko remained silent throughout the journey home and Sachiko and I conversed a little. Once I remember, Sachiko asked, Will your husband be angry with you? Quite possibly, I said with a smile. But I did warn him yesterday that I might be late. It's been an enjoyable day. Yes, Jiro will just have to sit and get angry. I've enjoyed today very much. We must do it again, let's go. Yes, we must. Remember, won't you? To come and visit me after I move? Yes, I remember. We fell silent again after that. It was a little later, just as the tram slowed for a stop. I felt such concert give a sudden start. She was looking down the carriage to where two or three people had gathered near the exit. A woman was standing there looking at Mariko. She was around 30 or so, and with a thin face and tired expression, it was conceivable she was gazing at Mariko quite innocently, but for Sachiko's reaction, I doubt it was my suspicions would have been aroused. In the meantime, Mariko continued to look out of the window, quite unaware of the woman. The woman noticed Sachiko looking at her and turned away. The tram came to a stop, the doors opened, and the woman stepped out. Did you know that person? I asked quietly. Sachiko laughed a little. No, I just made a mistake. You mistook her for someone else? Just for a moment. There wasn't even a resemblance really. She laughed again and then glanced outside to check where we were. Chapter 8 in retrospect, it seemed quite clear why Ogata-san remained with us for as long as he did that summer. Knowing his son well enough, he must have recognized Jiro's strategy over the matter concerning Shigeo Masuda's magazine. Article My husband was simply waiting for Ogata-san to return home to Fukuoka so the whole affair could be forgotten. Meanwhile, he would continue to agree readily to such an attack on the family name should be dealt with both promptly and firmly, that the matter was his concern as much as his father's and that he would write to his old school friend as soon as he had time. I can see it now, with hindsight. How typical this was of the way Jiro faced any potentially awkward confrontation. Had he not years later faced another crisis? In much the same manner, it may be that I would never have left Nagasaki. However, that is, by the way. 
I have recounted earlier some details of the evening my husband, two drunken colleagues arrived to interrupt the chess game between Jiro and Nogata-san. That night, as I prepared for bed, I felt a strong urge to talk to Jiro about the whole business concerning Shigeo Matsuda. While I did not wish Jiro to write such a letter against his will, I was feeling more and more keenly that he should make his position clearer to his father. As it was, however, I restrained from mentioning the subject that night, just as I had done on previous occasions. For one thing, my husband should have considered it no business of mine to comment on such a matter. Furthermore, at the time of night, Jiro was invariably tired and any attempts to converse would only make him impatient. In any case, it was never in the nature of our relationship to, to discuss such things openly. Throughout the following day, Ogata-san remained in the apartment, often studying the chess game which, so he told me, had been interrupted at such a crucial stage the previous night. Then, that evening, an hour or so after we had finished supper, he brought out the chessboard again and, and once more to study the pieces. Once, he looked up and said to my husband, So Jiro, tomorrow's a big day then. Jiro looked up from his newspaper and gave a short laugh. It's nothing to make fuss about, he said. Nonsense! It's a big day for you, of course. It's imperative to, for you to do your fat to do your best for the firm, but in my view, this is a triumph in itself, whatever the outcome tomorrow, to be asked to represent the firm at this level so early in your career, that cannot be usual even in these days. Jiro gave a shrug. I suppose not. Of course, even if tomorrow goes exceptionally well, that's no guarantee I'll get the promotion, but I suppose the manager must be reasonably pleased with my efforts this year. I should think he has great faith in you, by all accounts. And how do you think it will go tomorrow? Smoothly enough, I should hope. At this stage, all parties involved need to cooperate. It's more a case of laying the groundwork for the real negotiation in the autumn. It's nothing special. Well, we'll have to just wait and fin and see how it goes. Now, Jiro, why don't we finish off this game? We have been at it for three days. Oh yes, the game, of course. Father, you realize however successful I am tomorrow, there's no guarantee I'll be given a promotion? Of course not, Jiro. I realize these things. I came out through a competitive career myself. I know only too well how it is. Sometimes others are chosen in preference who, by all rights, shouldn't even be considered your equals. But you must not let such things deter you. You persevere and triumph in the end. Now, how about finishing off this game? My husband glanced towards the chessboard but showed no sign of moving near it. Yet just about one, if I remember, he said. Well, you are in quite a difficult corner, but there's a way out if you can find it. Do you remember, Jiro, when I first taught you this game? How I always warn you about using the castles too early. And you still make the same mistakes, do you see? The castles, yes, as you say. And incidentally, Jiro, I don't think you're thinking your moves out in advance, are you? Do you remember how much trouble I once took to make you plan at least three moves ahead? But I don't think you have been doing that. Three moves ahead? Well, no, I suppose I haven't. I can't claim to be an expert like yourself, father. In any case, I think we can say that you have won. In fact, Jiro, it became painfully obvious very early in the game that you weren't thinking your moves out. How often have I told you a good chess player needs to think ahead? Three moves on at the very least. Yes, I suppose so. For instance, why did you move the horse here? Jiro, look, you're not even looking. Can you even remember why you moved this year? Jiro glanced towards the board. To be honest, I didn't I don't remember, he said. There was probably a good enough reason at that time. A good enough reason? What nonsense, Jiro! 
For the first few moves you were planning ahead, I could see that you actually had a strategy then. But as soon as I broke up, I broke that down, you gave up. You began playing one move at a time. Don't you remember what I always tell you? Chess is all about maintaining coherent strategies. It's about not giving up when the enemy destroys one plan, but to immediately come up with the next. A game isn't won and lost at the point when the king is finally cornered. The game's sealed when the player gives up having any strategy at all. When his soldiers are all scattered, they have no common cause and they move one piece at a time, that's when you have lost. Very well, father. I admit it, I've lost. Now, perhaps we can forget about it. Ogata-san glanced towards me, then back at Jiro. Now, what kind of talk is that? I started this spot quite hard today, and I can see three separate means by which you can escape. My husband lowered his newspaper. Forgive me if I'm mistaken, he said, but I believe you just did it yourself. The player cannot maintain a coherent strategy is inevitably the loser. Well, as you have pointed out so repeatedly, I've been thinking only one move at a time, so there seems little point in carrying on. Now, if you will excuse me, I would like to finish reading this report. Why, Jiro? This is sheer defeatism. The game is far from lost, I just told you. You should be planning your defense now. To survive and fight me, Jiro, you always had a streak of defeatism in you ever since you were young. I had hoped I had taken it out from you, but here it is again, after all this time. Forgive me, but I fail to see what defeatism has to do with it. This is merely a game. It may indeed be just a game, but father gets to know his son well enough. A father can recognize these unwelcome traits when they arise. This is hardly e a quality. I'm proud in you, Jiro. You gave up as soon as your first strategy collapsed, and now you are forced on to the, the defensive. You sulk and don't want to play the game anymore. Why? This is just the way you were at 9 years old. Father? This is all nonsense. I have better things to do than think about chess all day. Jiro had spoken quite loudly and for a moment, Ogata-san looked somewhat taken aback. It may be very well for you, father, my husband continued. You have the whole day to dream up your strategies and ploys. Personally, I have better things to do with my time. With that, my husband returned to his paper. His father continued to stare at him, an astonished look on his face. Then finally, Ogata-san began to laugh. Come, Jiro, he said. Hang on. Come, Jiro, he said. We are shouting at each other like a pair of fishermen's wives. He gave another laugh. Like a pair of fishermen's wife. Jiro did not look up. Come on, Jiro. Let's stop our argument. If you don't want to finish the game, we don't have to finish it. My husband still gave no sign of being heard. Ogata-san laughed again. Alright, you win. We won't have to play anymore. But let me show you how you could have gotten out of this little corner here. There's three things you could have done. The first one is the most simple. And there's little I could have done about it. Look, Jiro. Look here. Look, I'm showing you something. Jiro continued to ignore his father. He had all the appearance of someone solemnly absorbed in his reading. He turned over a page and carried on reading. Ogata-san nodded to himself, laughing quietly. Just like when he was a child, he said. When he doesn't get his own way, he sulks and there's nothing to be done with him. He glanced towards where I was sitting and laughed rather oddly. Then he turned to a, he turned back to his son. Jiro, look, let me show you this at least. It's simplicity itself. Quite suddenly, my husband flung down his newspaper and made a movement towards his father. Clearly, what he intended was to knock the chessboard across 
across the floor with all the pieces with it. But he moved clumsily before he could strike the ball. His foot had upset the teapot beside him. The pot rolled onto its side. The lid fell open with a rattle and the tea ran swiftly across the surface of the tatami. Jiro, not sure what had occurred, turned and stared at the spilled tea. Then, he turned back and glared at the chessboard. The sights of the chessmen, still upright on their square, seemed to anger him all the more. And for a moment, I thought he would make another attempt for to, to upset them, as if... As it was, he got to his feet, snatched up his newspaper, and left the room without a word. I went over quickly to where the tea had sp spilt. Some of the liquid had begun to sunk into the cushion Jiro had been sitting on. I moved the cushion and rubbed at it with the edge of my apron. Just like he used to be, Ogata-san said, a faint smile had appeared around his eyes. Children become adults but they don't change much. I went out into the kitchen and found a cloth. When I returned, Ogata-san was sitting just as I had left him, the smile still hovering around his eyes. He was gazing at the puddle of the on the, on the tatami and looked deep in thought. Indeed, he seemed so absorbed by the sight of the tea, I hesitated a little before kneeling down to wipe it away. You must not let this upset you, Etsuko, he said eventually. It's nothing to upset yourself about. No, I continued to wipe the, the tatami. Well, I suppose we might as well turn in fairly soon. It's good to turn in early once in a while. Yes, you must not let this upset you, Etsuko. Jiro, we'll have forgotten the whole thing by tomorrow. You see, I remember these spells of his very well. In fact, it makes you quite nostalgic witnessing a little scene like that. It reminds you so much of when he was small. Yes, it's enough to make you quite nostalgic. I continue to wipe away the tea. Now let's go, he said. This is nothing to upset yourself about. I exchanged no further words with my husband until the following morning. He ate his breakfast, glancing occasionally at the morning newspaper I had placed beside his bowl. He spoke little and made no comment on the fact that his father had not emerged. For my part, I listened carefully for sounds from Ogata-san's room, but could hear nothing. I hope, uh, I hope it all goes well today, I said after we had sat in silence for some minutes. My husband gave a shrug. It's nothing to make fuss about, he said. Then he looked up at me and said, I wanted my black silk tie today, but you seem to have done something with it. I wish you wouldn't meddle with my ties. The black silk one? It's hanging on the rail with the other ties. It wasn't there just now. I wish you would stop meddling with them all the time. The silk one should be there with the others, I said. I ironed it the day, bef the day before yesterday because I knew you'd be wanting it for today. But I made sure to put it back. Are you sure it wasn't there? My husband sighed impatiently and looked down at the newspaper doesn't matter, he said. This one will have to do. He continued to eat in silence. Meanwhile, there was still no signs of Ogata-san, and eventually, I rose to my feet and went to listen outside his door. After several moments, I have heard, I have not heard a sound. I was about to slide open the door a little way, but my husband turned and said, What are you up to? I haven't got all morning, you know. He pushed his teacup forward. I seated myself again, put his used dishes away to one side, and poured him some tea. He sipped it rapidly and glancing over the front page of the newspaper. This is an important day for us, I said. I hope it goes well. It's nothing to make such a fuss about, he said, not looking up. However, before he left that morning, Jiro studied himself carefully in the mirror by the entryway, adjusting his tie, examining his jaw to check if he had shaved 
efficiently and when he had left I went over once more to Ogata-san's door and listened. I still could hear nothing. Father? I called softly. Ah, Etsuko. I heard Ogata-san's voice from within. I might have known you wouldn't let me lie in. Somewhat relieved, I went to the kitchen to prepare a fresh pot of tea, then laid the table ready for Ogata-san's breakfast. When he eventually sat down to eat, he remarked casually, Jiro's already left, I suppose. Oh yes, he went a long time ago. I was just about to throw father's breakfast away. I thought he'd be far too lazy to get up before noon. Now, don't be cruel, Etsuko. When you get to my age, you like to relax once in a while. Besides, this is like a vacation for me, staying here with you. Well, I suppose just this once then. Father can be forgiven for being so lazy. I won't get the opportunity to lie in like this once I get back to Fukuoka, he said, taking up his chopsticks. Then he sighs deeply. I suppose it's time I was getting back soon. Getting back? But there's no hurry, father. No, I really have to be getting back soon. There's plenty of work to be getting on with. Work? What work is that? Well, for start, I need to build a new panel for the veranda. Then there's the rockery. I haven't even started on it yet. The stones were delivered months ago and they've been waiting. Then the garden waiting for me. He gave a sigh and began to eat. <sighs> I certainly won't get to lie in like this once I get back. But there's no need to go just yet, is there, father? The rockery can wait a little longer. You're very kind, let's go, but time's pressing on now. You see, I'm expecting my daughter and her husband down again this autumn, and I'll need to get all this work done before they come. Last year, the year before, they came to see me in autumn, so I rather suspect they'll want to come and see again. I see. Yes, they are bound to want to come again this autumn. It's the most convenient time for Kikuko's husband, and Kikuko's always saying in his letters how curious she is to see my new house. Ogata-san nodded to himself and carried on eating from his bowl. I watched him for a while. What a loyal daughter Kikuko-san is to you, father, I said. It's a long way to come, all the way from Osaka. She must miss you. I suppose she feels the need to get away from her father-in-law once in a while. I can't think why else she would want to come so far. How unkind of you, father. I'm sure she misses you. I'll have to tell her what you're saying. Ogata-san laughed. But it's true. All Watanabe rules over them like warlords. Whenever they come down, they are forever talking about how intolerable he's getting. Personally? I rather like the old man, but there's no denying he's an old warlord. I expect they'll like some place like this, Etsuko. An apartment like this just to themselves is no bad thing. Young couples living away from the parents, more and more couples do it now. Young people don't want overbearing old men ruling over them forever. Ogata-san seemed to remember the food in his bowl, and he began to eat hurriedly. When he finished, he got to his feet and went over to the window. For a moment, he stood there, his back to me, looking at the view. Then he adjusted the window to let in more air and took a deep breath. Are you pleased with your new house, father? I asked. My house? Why, yes. It will need a little more work here and there, I say. But it's much more compact. The Nagasaki house was far too large for just one old man. He continued to gaze out the window. In the sharp morning light, all I could see of his head was shoulders and a hazy outline. But it was a nice house, the old house, I said. I still stop and look at it with, if I am walking away. If I'm walking that way. In fact, I went past it last week on my way back from Mrs. Fujiwara's. I thought he had not heard me, for he continued to gaze silently out at the window. But a moment later, he said, 
And how did it look, the old house? Oh, much the same. The new occupants must like it the way father left it. He turned towards me slightly. And what about the azaleas? Etsuko, were the azaleas still in the gateway? The brightness still prevented me from seeing his face clearly, but I suppose from his voice that he was smiling. Azaleas? Well, I suppose there's no reason why you should remember. He returned back to the window and stretched out his arm. I planted them in the gateway that day, the day it was all finally decided. The day what was decided, the day when you and Jiro were to be married, but I never told you about the azaleas. I suppose it's rather unreasonable of me to expect you to remember them. You planted some azaleas for me? Now, that was quite a nice thought, but no, I don't think you ever mentioned it. But you see, it's go you asked for them. He had turned towards me again. In fact, you positively ordered me to plant them in the gateway. What? I laughed. I ordered you? Yes, you ordered me, like I was some hired gardener, don't you remember? Just when I thought it was all settled at last, you were finally to become my daughter-in-law. You told me there was one thing more. You wouldn't leave in the house without azaleas in the gateway and if I didn't plant azaleas the whole thing would be called off so what could I do? I ran straight out and planted the azaleas I laughed a little now you mention it I said I remember something like that but what nonsense father I never forced you oh yes you did Atsuko you said you wouldn't leave in the house without azaleas in the gateway he came away from the window and sat down opposite me again. Yes, Etsuko. He said, just like a hired gardener. We both laughed and I began to pour out the tea. Azaleas were, my fav were always my favorite flowers, you see, I said. Yes, so you said. I finished pouring with sex silently for a few moments, watching the, stream, the steam rise from the teacup. And I had no idea then, I said, about Jiro's plans, I mean. No. I reached forward and placed a plate of small cakes by his teacup. Ogata-san regarded them with a smile. Eventually, he said, The azaleas came up beautifully. But by that time, of course, you had moved away. Still, it's not a bad thing at all, young couples living on their own. Look at Kikuko and her husband. They would love to have a little place of their own, but the old Watamanabe won't even let them consider it. What an old lord he is. Now that I think of it, I said, there were azaleas in the gateway last week. The new occupants must agree with me. Azaleas are essential for gateway. I'm sure they are still there. Ogata-san took a sip from his cup. Then he sighed and said with a laugh, Ah, what an old warlord that Watanabe is. Shortly after breakfast, Ogata-san suggested we should go and look around Nagasaki like tourists do, as he put it. I agreed at once and we took the tram into the city. As I recall, we spent some time at an art gallery and then a little before noon, we went to visit the Peace Memorial in the large public park not far from the center of the city. The park was commonly known as Peace Park. I never discovered whether this was the official name. And indeed, despite the sound of children and birds, an atmosphere of sol solemnity hung over the large expanse of the green. The usual adornments such as shrubs and fountains had been kept to a minimum, and the effect was, of, was a kind of austerity. The flat grass, a white summer sky, and the memorial itself, a massive white statue in memory of those killed by the, by the atomic bomb presiding over its domain. The statue resembles a muscular Greek god seated with both arms outstretched. With his right hand, he pointed to the sky from where the bomb had fallen. His other arm stretched out to the left. The figure was supposedly holding back the forces of evil. His eyes were closed in prayer. 
It was always my feeling that the statue had a rather cumbersome appearance, and I'm never able to associate it with what had occurred the day the bomb had fallen, and those terrible days which followed. Seen from a distance, the figure looked almost comical, resembling a policeman conducting traffic. It remained for me nothing more than a statue, and while most people in Nagasaki seem to appreciate it as some form of gesture, I suspect the general feeling was much like mine. And today, should I by chance recall that large white statue in Nagasaki, I find myself reminded primarily of my visit to the Peace Park with Ogata-san that morning, on that business concerning his postcard. It doesn't look quite so impressive in picture, I remember Ogata-san saying, holding up the postcard of the statue which he had just bought. We were standing some 50 yards or so from the monument. I have been meaning to send back a card for some time, he continued. I'll be going back to Fukuoka any day now, but I suppose it's still worth sending, Etsuko. Do you have a pen? Perhaps I should send it straight away, otherwise I'm bound to forget. I found a pen in my handbag and we sat down on a bench nearby. I became curious when I noticed him staring at the blank side of the card, his pen poised but not writing. Once or twice I saw him glance up towards the statue as if for inspiration. Finally, I asked him, Are you sending it to a friend in Fukuoka? Well, just an acquaintance. Father's looking very guilty, I said. I wonder who it can be he's writing to. Ogata-san glanced up with a look of astonishment, then he burst into laughter. Guilty? Am I really? Yes, very guilty. I wonder what father gets up to when there's no one to keep an eye on him. Ogata-san continued to laugh loudly. He was laughing so much I could feel the bench shake. He recovered a little and said, Very well, Itsuko, you caught me. You have caught me writing to my girlfriend. He used the English word, caught me red-handed. He began laughing again. I've always suspected father led a glamorous life in Fukuoka. Yes, Etsuko. <laughs> he was still life laughing a little. A very glamorous life. Then he took a deep breath and looked down once more at his postcard. You know, I really don't know what to write. Perhaps I could send it just with nothing written. After all, I only wanted to show her what the memorial looked like. But then again, perhaps that's rather too formal. Well, I can't advise you, father, unless you reveal who this mysterious lady is. The mysterious lady at school runs a small restaurant in Fukuoka. It's quite near my house, so I usually go there for my evening meals. I talk to her sometimes. She's pleasant enough. I promise I will send her a postcard of the peace memorial. I'm afraid that's all there to it. I see, father, but I'm still suspicious. Quite a pleasant old woman. But she gets tiresome after a while. If I'm the only customer, she stands and talks through the meal. Unfortunately, there aren't many other suitable places to eat nearby, you see, Etsuko. If you would teach me how to cook as you promised, then I wouldn't need to suffer the likes of her. But it would be pointless, I said, laughing. Father would never get the hang of it. Nonsense! You're simply afraid I'll surpass you. It's more selfish of you, Etsuko. Now let me see. As he looked at his postcard once more. What can I say to the old lady? Do you remember Mrs. Fujiwara? I asked. She runs a noodle shop now near father's old house. Yes, so I hear. A great pity. Someone of a position running a noodle shop. But she enjoys it. It gives her something to work for. She often asks after you. A great pity, he said again. Her husband was such a distinguished man. I had so much respect for him. And now she is running a noodle shop. Extraordinary. He shook his head gravely. I'll call in and pay my respects. But then I suppose she would find it rather awkward in the present circumstances, I mean. Father? She's not ashamed to be running a noodle shop. She's quite proud of it. 
She says she's always wanted to run a business, however humble. I expect she would be delighted if you call on her. Her shop is in Nakagawa, you say? Yes, quite near to the old house. Ogata-san seemed to, recon- seemed to consider this for some time. Then he turned to me and said, Right then, let's go. Let's go and pay her a visit. He scribbled quickly on the postcard and gave me back the pen. You mean go now, father? I was a little taken aback by his sudden decisiveness. Yes, why not? Very well. I suppose you could give us lunch. Yes, perhaps. But I have no wish to humiliate the good lady. She would be pleased to give us lunch, father. Ogata-san nodded and for a moment did not speak. Then he said with some deliberation. As a matter of fact, Etsuko, I've been thinking of visiting Nakagawa for some time now. I would like to call in on some certain person there. Oh? I wonder if he would be in at this time of day. Who is it you wish to call on, father? Shigeo. Shigeo Matsuda? I've been intending to pay him a call for some time. Perhaps he takes his lunch in ho- at-, at home. In which case, I may just catch him. That would be preferable to, dis- to disturbing him at his school. For a few minutes, Ogata-san gazed towards the statue, a slightly puzzled look on his face. I remained silent, watching the postcard he was rotating in his hand. Then suddenly, he slapped his knees and stood up. Right, let's go. He said, let's do that then. We'll try Shigeo first. Then, we will call in on Mrs. Fujiwara. It must have been around noon when we boarded the tram to take us to Nakagawa. The car was stiflingly crowded and streets outside were filled with the lunchtime hordes. But as we came away from the city center, the passengers became more sparse and by the time the car reached its terminus at, Nakaga- at Nakagawa, there were only a handful of us left. Stepping out of the tram, Ogata-san paused for a moment and stroked his chin. It was not easy to tell whether he was savoring the feeling of being back in the district or whether he was simply trying to remember the way to Shigeo Matsuda's house. We were standing in the concrete yard surrounding, surrounded by several empty tram cars. Above our heads, a maze of black wires crossed the air. The sun was shining down with some force, causing the painted surface surfaces of the cars to gleam sharply. What heat, Ogata-san remarked, wiping his forehead and then he began to walk, leading the way towards a row of houses which began to on the far side of the tram. The district had not changed greatly over the years as we walked. The narrow roads twisted, climbed and fell. Houses, many of them still familiar to me, stood whenever the hilly landscape would permit. Some were perched precariously on slopes, others squeezed into unlikely corners. Blankets and laundry hung from many of the balconies. We walked on past other houses more grand looking, but we passed neither Ogata-san's old house nor the house I had once lived in with my, own, with my parents. In fact, the thought occurred to me that perhaps Ogata-san had chosen a route so as to deliberately avoid them. I doubt if we walked for much more than 10 or 15 minutes in all, but the sun and the steep hills became very tiring. Eventually, we stopped halfway up a steep path and Ogata-san ushered me underneath the shelter of a leafy tree that hung over the pavement. Then. He pointed across the road to a pleasant-looking old house with large sloping roof tiles in the traditional manner. That's Shigeo's place, he said. I knew his father quite well. As far as I know, his mother still lived with him. Then Okata-san began to stroke his chin just as he had done on the first stepping of the tram. I said nothing and waited. Quite possibly he won't be home say Ogata-san. He'll probably spend his lunch break in the staff room with his colleagues. 
I continued to wait silently. Ogata-san remained standing beside me, gazing at the house. Finally, he said, Let's go. How far is it to Mrs. Fujiwara's from here? Have you any idea? It's just a few minutes' walk, father. Now that I think of it, perhaps it may be best if you went on ahead. I could meet you there. That may be the best thing. Very well, if that's what you wish for. In fact, this was all very inconsiderate of me. I am not an invalid, father. He laughed quickly, then glanced again towards the house. I think it might be best, he said again. You go on ahead. Very well. I don't expect to be long. In fact, he glanced once more towards the house. In fact, why don't you wait here until I pull the bell? If you see me go in, then you can go on to Mrs. Fujiwara's. This has all been very inconsiderate of me. It is perfectly alright, father. Now listen carefully or else you will never find the noodle shop. You remember where the, doc the doctor used to have his surgery? But Ogata-san was no longer listening. Across the road, the entrance gate had slid open. A thin, young man with spectacles had appeared. He was dressed in his shirt sleeve and held a small briefcase under his arm. He squinted a little as he stepped further into the glare, then bent over the briefcase and began searching through it. Shigeo Matsuda looked thinner and more youthful than I remembered him from the few occasions I had met him in the past. And ladies and gentlemen, that is the end of chapter 8 and I shall end my reading for today because it's already been 2 hours I mean, uh, looking at the chapters right now, we will be finishing this book the next reading Definitely Definitely once again, thank you so much for being here with me. Thank you, Coco, for being here with me. Oh, my God. I really appreciate it. Hang on. Thank you so much. For being here with me today, everyone, whoever is here, new viewers, old viewers, oh my god, I'm just, I keep spilling water all over my desk, it's a miracle that I didn't kill my keyboard yet, but yes, thank you guys. Sorry, I took like a long break in between talking to Sam for like 10 years about a potential trip to uh, to the Aussie land. But yeah, it sucks. And EPA, I hate visa. I hate applying for visa. I used to do it for like Japan. It's such it's so much hassle. Wait. But yes, thank you, my dear, for being here.
see it here. Oh no. You're cleaning your room while you're listening. <laughs> That's a very good choice. Um, I am a huge thrifter. I'm planning to thrift some nice clothing. Um, and maybe some jewelry. I'm very into rings nowadays. Uh, I'm very yeah. I'm very into rings nowadays. Very big obnoxious rings statement rings as they call it uh, and just I don't know just take a look at um, what the local I don't know I like supporting local businesses because of how bad our situation is like a lot of people got laid off and all that so I'm trying to be like um, if I can afford it I would love to help them out I would say you know and uh, my friend is selling some um, my friend is a thrift uh, shop owner uh, uh, not shop, but you know, like Instagram shop kind of shop. Uh, I, I basically know her from buying stuff from her, and and yeah. I want to get I don't know maybe I can take some photos tomorrow and post it on uh, Twitter tomorrow you know let's see how it goes uh, sorry I'm a bit out of it today maybe you guys can sense it maybe not maybe I'm just pointing out nonsense now but I'm like kind of tired today I don't I'm not even sure why I had like a kind of like an uh, a weird, a very weird argument with my friend last night and it was definitely very weird Reels? <laughs> um. Reels story? Can you do that? I, I got I'm getting a new phone. I'm waiting for its arrival. Uh, I think maybe I'm gonna try to uh, install uh, Streamlab or maybe like just straight up Twitch on the new phone so that I can do IRL stream uh, show you guys around but don't stalk and kill me please. Three reels oh. Nah, I'll just take some. I think I'll just take like, some photos and then I'll, uh, uh, I'll post it on Twitter. But then I said that the last time, ha 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 ha. Um, I didn't really post anything. I'll look through. I'll look through my. Oh yeah, I I think last time I told Bit, Bit Evelyn, uh, that I will post some like photos that I took. I'll post some of them today. I'll choose some of them and post them up today. Mm. Well, you guys take a look of my style of fo so-called fo photography. I guess I don't think it's really photography. I just, I just the way I take pictures is like it's just I look, I look up. I think it's interesting. I'll take a picture. If I look down, so if it's interesting, I'll take a picture. Is I, I, I usually don't give much thoughts to it like composition and all that i'm not like you know pro a professional um 
Oh yeah. Uh, I found my old uh camera uh uh analog camera that I, like you know you guys oh my god I feel so old for saying this but like I don't even know if this brand still exists oh it does it still exists but you know back in like early 2000 10 or so uh, that was this Japanese uh, like Lomography uh, brand that is like that is the cameras are super fucking cute and I have an analog camera from there and it's I used to like take it to travel every time everywhere I go um, but I stopped doing that I stopped taking pictures basically like Lomograph pictures it's uh, it's a great camera actually like, it's a white camera a white angle camera so it's like really really good the brand doesn't I don't even think the brand exists anymore. I'm trying to look for it and it's like I can't find it anymore basically. And I found I found a, a new like a Fuji uh, sorry a Kodak film camera uh Ultra F9. It looks so fucking good and it's like such it's like my aesthetic. I'm like I think I wanna buy it but maybe next time. But I bought like some new uh, film rolls, and then I'm gonna start taking pictures. Uh, with my with my film camera again. I cleaned it up yesterday. Um. Uh, luckily, it's still in good condition, despite my terrible way of keeping things most of the time. Um. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to get those uh, film rolls so that I can start taking pictures. But I'm not going anywhere, so I don't know what kind of pictures. Like the pictures that I took is usually just like you know, uh, pictures of sky and all that. Um, I'll show. I'll post some pictures on uh, Twitter later of my uh, so-called photography. Uh, yeah. So t I bought so much shit recently. Is like most of them are essential stuff. Like my phone, I can feel it's dying, so I need to buy a new phone. So I got a new phone. Um, I bought skincare. <laughs> Bought phone accessories because I have I'm going to have a new phone soon. <laughs> I don't know. <sighs> oh man, I feel so old. Like you know, the thrift shopping was such a big thing back in like 2010, 2011. Um, oh, okay, thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it, seriously. Thank you. Shopping and uh, Lomo Graphy. Do you guys know what Lomo Graphy is? It's like Lomo Photography. It was so big in like 2010, 2011. I was very into the whole vintage thrifting Lomo Graphy scene. And then it started to die out around like 2014, 2013, 2015. Uh, then there's this new wave of like. Um, 
I don't know. Uh, it's just a, a new wave of other interests, I guess. Like you know, Instagram came out uh, in twenty thirteen, I think, and then things just started to shift from like Flickr account to like Instagram and all that. So. Yeah, and then suddenly, out of nowhere, because I don't know what happened, like people are like, "Oh, I, I'm take, I'm taking, like you know, disposable film cameras, or I'm using the film cameras again, and all that stuff." And I'm like, "I, you guys are like ten years late, bruh. <laughs> I'm such a hipster. I can't help it." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but see, I have a I have a Flickr account and I have my photography in there and all that. I will, I will not share it with you guys. <laughs> but yeah, it's like people just move on to like ease easier social media like in Flickr I used to be like in a group of like you know local lomography like people who are like lomography groups and all that and we'll discuss what film to use you know what camera to buy there were like a big scene of like people importing cameras from Japan like lomography camera and I still regret to this day that I didn't buy the one that I wanted but it was like really expensive I think around like 400 ringgit or something and like I didn't buy it to this and I still regretted it because it's like a camera that you can you, it's like you can build it yourself it's like those camera that you look down to set the scene it's like old school camera, but it's like modern old school camera, if you get what I mean. Yeah, I still regret I didn't get that camera. <sighs> and I can't find it anymore now. I feel so old. I'm so old. I'm so old and tired and... And uh... Everything. I don't know what I'm doing with my life But it's okay Anyway guys I think it's almost Lunch time for me I guess I don't know I can, s I can sit and talk with you guys For a while more It's not even 2 o'clock Usually it ends at 2, but I'm I can hang for a while. No, I'm old. I'm not any wiser than any of you. There are people who are younger than me that I found a lot more mature than I am. You know? Like my tattoo artist, she's fucking awesome. Oh my god. I will never, like, I'm such a loyal person that it's like, I will never find, and I will never use another tattoo artist anymore in my life. Like, I will always go back to find her. She even touch up a tattoo that is not done by her for me without charging me. I feel, so, I feel like I'm taking advantage of her. But then at the same time, I'm always also bringing her a fuck ton of, like, snacks and shit <laughs> every time I go there. And their studio is so near me that I can just walk to their studio anytime I want. So it's kind of like... I don't know. I assume you are all from Malaysia. I don't know why, I have this feeling. I assume that Ando is from Malaysia. I assume Tazamina is from Malaysia. I'm just I'm just scrolling Instagram while I uh, talk to you guys. You know, for a while I wasn't so addicted to uh, 
Instagram anymore. And then ah ah the he tentacle hentai lover requested a tarot card reader. Reading. Hang on. Give me one moment. Bring the cards over. Grab back. Neuro, you will forever be called a tentacle hentai lover from now on. Yeah, because because you're so fucking creepy. I was creeping. Alrighty. Uh, I like it when people know exactly what they want. Fire shuffle. Sh fire shuffle. <laughs> Shuff shuffle. <laughs> oh God. No. Singaporean Nando. Thank you for supporting. Uh, very poor Malaysian here. I'm making some Sing dollar, you know. I have connections in Singapore. <laughs> okay, what? For shuffle five. One, two, three, four, five. Top. Cut of the day. Knight of Pentacle. Wait, didn't you get Knight of Pentacle the last time? Knight of Pentacle the last time, didn't you? I'm using a different deck too. What did you get last time? Ah, no. I don't think you have gotten this one. I don't recall reading this. I think you got... I think you got Knight of... So, yeah, ah, you got two swords, that's right. And that, someone got Knight of Ten Pentacles. Okay, Knight of Pentacles, the keywords steadfastness, practicality, practicality, caution, lethargy, narrowness, boredom. Okay, so if this knight represents a real person, he is not flashy or adventurous or even a particularly creative guy but you can depend on him and he is willing to do what's necessary to bring his goals to fruition so as usual the person depicted in the card could be yourself or it could be someone you meet uh, throughout your day so if you think it the description relates to yourself then maybe you can um, trust yourself you can you can trust to depend on yourself to do what's necessary to bring your goals to fruition but if you are at a situation whereby you you don't know what's happening yet throughout the day because it's it's only 1 30 p.m right now and Maybe later on the day you encounter something and you meet someone who will help you. It's like he's not a flashy guy. Maybe it's your dad, right? Like you know, uh, not a flashy guy, but he's very dependable. Okay, uh, money, possession, and status means a lot to him. Oh my god, Nero, are you Singaporean? <laughs> He often succeeds through determination and effort, not inspiration or, or genius. Symbolically, 
This card speaks of perseverance, dedication, loyalty, and steadiness in the face of change and turmoils. Oh, you're a Malaysian then. In reading about money, day it would just basically means that you could be the knight and you can depend on yourself to work on something that you are working on don't think that you can't do it because you absolutely can uh, don't doubt yourself basically but if this is someone else that appears in your life today then um, don't think that that person is useless because he's not fancy or he doesn't look like he's up for the job. Don't judge him by his cover. Uh, trust that he can help you. Basically, there will be someone. It's either you or someone else for today. So your card of the day is the Knight of Pentacles. Aww, Ando is a romantic. Okay, give me one moment. Let me get the book. Paolo Coelho Paolo Coelho Selected quotations on love Can you give me a page please? Uh, Ando? You can choose from page uh, 10 until 1 to 8 No worries Nero, you're welcome You're most welcome You redeem it with your hard earned point I mean Banduna points So, and then you can choose from page 120 120 120 120 From the book The Witch of Portobello by Paolo Coelho. The quote is Surrendering completely to love, be it human or divine, means giving up everything, including our own well being or our ability to make decisions. It means loving in the deepest sense of the word. I'll repeat it. Surrendering completely to love, be it human or divine, means giving up everything, including our own well-being or our ability to make decisions. It means Loving in the deepest sense of the word. That is the quote on love for Ando. You guys have anything else you guys want to? Play? I uh, want to claim your new points for something. If not, I will end the stream with a poem of my own choice. Ah, you're most welcome. You spend on it. I'm going to flip a book or poem, and then I'm going to choose one. Uh, actually, you know what? I want to get Emily Dickinson because she's depressing as hell.
Have a nice day. Taza. Do you want to wait for me to finish reading a poem for you before you go? Anyway, I'm gonna flip and then stop. Flip and stop. Return. Wait, hang on. Jesus. Return in 1863, I think. Poem number 276. Jesus Christ. Emily Dickinson has like an insane amount of Ah, okay Okay, written in 1863, published in 1929 Poem number 276 By Emily Dickinson The love a life can show below is but a filament i know of that divine div diviner oh my god my english all right let me start again the love a life can show below is but a filament i know of the diviner thing that faints upon the face of noon and smites the tinder in the sun and hinders Gabriel's wing this this in music hints and sways and far abroad on summer days distills uncertain pain this this enormous in the east and tints the transit in the west with harrowing iodine this this invites a pause and douse flits glimmers proves dissolves return suggests convicts and chants then flings in paradise and that is poem 276 by emily dickinson that I shall end today's stream by saying having a have a great day have a great Thursday have a great rest of the week and have a great weekend ahead and I shall see you guys tomorrow I'll post something up later pictures photos that I took and all that uh, if you are Malaysians please don't stalk me um, I'll see you guys soon. Thank you for listening. Have a great day. Goodbye. Na 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 na